book of beginnings. The book of beginnings is what? Genesis. Genesis is where it all began. The book of Genesis. And if you would be so kind to find your way to Genesis, in particular, the second chapter, Genesis chapter 2. Grab your Bibles and turn with me so we can take a look together. Amen. Genesis, the second chapter. Of course, you remember and recall that I began last week a series entitled Family Matters. Last week's message was the first installment to this particular series. And, uh, we're going to go for a few weeks, see what the Lord says. Uh, whenever he says quit, we'll quit. We'll stop but uh, there's a few uh, messages that I believe that we all could stand to hear and learn from and glean from as we attempt to uh, structure our families the way that God wants and desires for them to be. So last week uh, was the beginning of that particular series. Amen. You all at Genesis? Yeah. All right, Genesis 2, I want to read for you and to you, if you don't mind, verses 15 through 25. From the New King James Version, here's how the Word of God reads. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, nor in the day that you eat. Of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took the one, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. For this particular installment of Family Matters, I want to use the topic and the title, Before You Say, I Do. Yeah. Before You Say, I Do. Can you get Jimmy with it and take a look at your neighbor before you take your seat to say neighbor? neighbor. The preacher is going to preach about <laughs> what you're supposed to do, <laughs> how you're supposed to act, before you say, I do. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Before you say, I do. That is actually a different sermon, Jeff. Before you say, I do. Again. So we have one specifically for those who have said, I do before. And then I did I do and decided to do I do again. Amen. So we, we, that's a sermon coming to you, near you, the pulpit near you. Amen. For those of you that remember uh, from a previous sermon series on the family entitled uh, Focus on the Family, I told you that the first institution that God ever created was family or marriage. The first institution, the first uh, organization that God ever formed was family. It was marriage between a man and a woman, a family unit where uh, they established a family and end up having children and so on and so forth. 
I also told you in that series that families matter to God. So families ought to matter to us. And you know that anything that matters to God and anything that's important to God, <coughs> Satan has his, his eyes on it and he has his hands in it. Satan's goal and desire is to unravel and to undo any and everything that God has created and established. Because for Satan, obviously he hates God, so therefore he hates the children of God, the people of God, and the things of God. So his life's mission, as it were, is to wreak havoc and to disrupt and to disturb and to dismantle any and everything that God has created and formed. If it means something to God, then it means something to Satan. Because Satan hates God. So he's going to do everything he possibly can to mess it up. And he's been doing that from the very beginning. And what we see here, my brothers and my sisters, is the formation, the development, the creation of this institution called marriage slash family. And we see Satan busily getting involved from the very beginning of this establishment. For when we read this text, we see that God had created all things, of course, uh, all things that come into existence. He created mankind, and after a period of time, um, he uh, made the declaration that it was not good for man to be alone and created man, as the King James Version would say, a help meet, um, or one who was compatible um, and comparable. Um, to Adam, um, to this first man. And it was during these two, the union of these two, that um, things were being established in a model and a way that God wanted it, things to go. And Satan, of course, slithered in like he always does. Um, Satan has a way of slithering in and sneaking in our situations and in our lives, in our homes, and in our families. And that's exactly what he did here. And he slithered in and he was very deceptive. It's interesting to know. That Satan, we always say that, uh, you know, he, he lied to Adam and Eve. When he didn't so much lie, he just was deceptive in what he said. He twisted the truth and, uh, and, and got them off track uh, through the woman. So, as we talked about last week, um, about, you know, we as individuals being um, a best, the best version of ourselves, being a better version of ourselves, and being in the image of God and so on and so forth, all that type of um, language and, and information. I want you to now look at, as we move forward to establishing the family, before you even begin to look at or consider uh, a mate or a spouse, a boo thing, or whatever you want to call him or her, before you even go down that path, I want to suggest to you that there is a starting place um, that we all ought to and might want to consider. Um, this message may seem specifically geared towards singles, and there is a lot of content in here for singles, but it's not just for singles. Um, and for those of you who are single and say, Pastor, you can say this message because I have no intentions on getting married. Uh, I'm single, and I'm satisfied, and I'm cool. Uh, or at this age and stage in my life, you know, this is not going to happen. Well, you never know. God may want to take these nuggets and take these truths that are deposited into you and given to you today and um, may want you to pass them on either to your children or to someone else that you may come in contact with. So if you decided in your mind, I ain't never get married, I want to get married, I'm good, or it's too late for me, or whatever the case may be, there's still some good stuff in here that I believe that you could use and that you can pass on. So let's start off here. Let's start off here. I, I want to suggest that as we are moving toward establishing a family, a family unit, that it starts with a foundation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. It starts with the foundation. Anything that is going to be built and anything that is going to last and anything that is going to stand, it has to have a firm and solid foundation. You cannot build this church. You cannot build your house. You cannot build a building any, of any form of any type without there being some form of foundation. When we talk about your family unit, it is something 
uh, that needs to be built upon something firm and or solid. And that form, uh, that, that solid foundation, my brothers and my sisters, ought to begin, number one, with you being God-fearing. Amen. That's the, that's the first layer. That's the first step. That is what we ought to uh, focus on first and foremost before we do anything else is we ought to first be God-fearing. That's exactly what Adam was. Mm -hmm. this, this narrative that I've read to you today serves as a uh, blueprint, if you will, on how things are to go uh, when it comes to us developing our lives and to us forming our own family unit. Mm -hmm. And so Adam, first of all, he shows us a model because he was God-fearing. He had a healthy, watch this, healthy relationship with God. Before you begin anything in your life, friends, whether you end up with a, a, a significant other or not, it starts off with you having a firm foundation and you being a God-fearing individual, man or woman. If God is not first in your life, then you've got things out of order. If, not, if God is not first in your life, then my brothers and my sisters, you are doomed from the start because God becomes... Um, not only uh, the one, if, if he is your creator, if he's the one that created all things, we must become connected to the one that created us. Because he is our source, he is our strength. The Bible reminds us that it is in him that we move, we breathe, and we have our being. Our existence, my brothers and my sisters, is uh, all, uh, it all began uh, from the very hands of God. God created us, and so therefore, before we move in any direction, we must first of all ensure that we are God-fearing. We have a healthy relationship with God. We are connected to the creator that created us. And that was Adam. He had that healthy relationship. The Bible says, in the coolness of the day, they conversed and they fellowship. They were in good relationship one with another. So not only must we as individuals be God-fearing, having a good relationship with our Lord. We must also, my brothers and my sisters, be in a good space. We must be in a good space. And that good space I'm talking about mentally, I'm talking about physically, I'm talking about spiritually, I'm talking about mind, body, and soul. We are triadic beings, right? Made up of mind, body, and soul. And so within our collective self, we ought to make certain that we're in a good space. Some of us are trying to move forward with our lives and form our lives and, and form lives and form families when we as individuals are not good. Amen. We got to make certain that we are in a good headspace, that we're thinking right. We got to make certain that we are in a good um, space as it relates to our, our body. We're taking care of our temples and taking care of our health. And obviously, I've already spoke on spiritually. So we as individuals must not only be God-fearing, but we, my friends, we must be in a good space. But then not only must we be in a good space, we must also become gainfully employed. Come on, I mean, it's right here in the text. First of all, Adam was, he was God-fearing. He had a relationship with God. All right? Him and God were cool. They were on good terms. They were on speaking terms. Amen. Are you and God on speaking terms? Not only was he um, God-fearing, but he was in a good space. Adam was given stewardship over everything that God had created. God had created the heavens and the earth, and he created, uh, you know, the trees and birds and animals and all these things. And he told, brought them to Adam and told Adam to name them. Whatever he would name them would be their names. He was doing this. Um, and he was being a good steward because he told him to tend and take care of the garden. So he was cool. Adam had a place to live. He had a good relationship with God. His needs were taken care of. He was in good health. He was in a good health, um, a good mind space and, and all of that. Adam was cool. And he was living his best life. And as Adam was living his good life, best life, as God-fearing and, uh, and being in a good space, he was also gainfully employed. He was working. He was tilling the ground. He was taking care of the ground and, and everything. That was his job. The animals and all that stuff, all that was entrusted to him. Mm -hmm. He was being a good steward, and he was gainfully 
employee. Friends, as we move forward to form our families, it is incumbent upon us, uh, it is indicative that we find employment. <laughs> we find something that we give our lives to, uh, use our gifts toward to make, uh, uh, to take care of ourselves and to make a contribution back to the society. Are y'all hearing me on today? Be gainfully employed. Some people have no desire to do anything with what God has given to them. Right. He's given you gifts and he's given you abilities. He's given you the uh, mobility to and, uh, and functionality to go out and do something with your life. And so if you have that, there's no reason why you ought not be gainfully employed, doing something constructive and doing something productive. Right. Amen. Amen. And that's what Adam is doing. These uh, steps, these things are essential um, as we move forward and form a family unit. But then there was one last thing that I want to point out. Not only was he God fearing, not only was he in good space, not only was he gainfully employed, but it was then that he was guided. Mm. He was guided to the person to whom God um, had uniquely created in such a fashion that would complement what God had in store for Adam and for mankind. But the prerequisite was God family, good space, gainfully employed. It was then that he now leads him and guides him to find someone who would be a complement to him. So as we are looking at this, it was then that God said, okay, uh, it's not good for man to be alone. I would give him a help me. I would give him a companion who was compatible. Mm, starting to get good now. Y'all can go ahead and wake up. Amen. He put him to sleep. While he was asleep, God did his magic. Uh, the seasoned preachers used to say many years ago that one of the reasons that God put man to sleep is so that man would not get involved and mess things up. Uh, that's a cute way of saying things, but in, in reality, God didn't need man's help for this one. God had this all under control. And he extracted from man a part of man, and it was that which he extracted, uh, he used that to create man's counterpart, Adam's counterpart, his complement, his helpmate, his companion. And when Adam woke up, the Bible says that he saw what God had done. And he said, whoa, man. And she's been known as woman ever since. <laughs> he looked at her, and she was curvaceous. Something totally different from the monkeys. <laughs> he looked at her. Her skin was soft and beautiful. Something totally different from the hippopotamuses. She, he looked at her, and she was, uh, was wonderful and great to look upon and, and smelt uh, good, unlike the donkeys and all the rest of the animals. Did they have donkeys in the prayer? Anyways, he saw this beautiful woman, and he was a tree, and he was drawn toward her. She was drawn toward him. And it was then that they began to form a family. Mm -hmm. So as we look at this, before you say I do, I told you these are the things that you as an individual ought to be mindful of mm -hmm. for yourself. But can I now use those same points and massage it in such a way that as you are looking at your counterpart mm -hmm. or a potential mate, that these are some of the same things you ought to be looking at uh, when you look at them. Mm -hmm. What am I saying? Give me a few moments and I'll make it make sense. Watch this. Number one, the person that you're looking at, they, just like you, ought to be God-fearing. <laughs> we ought not move any further. We ought not have any additional conversations and encounters and so on and so forth um, and, and, and talk about and notion about us getting together if first of all, first of all, you have not gotten together with God. Uh -huh. If you're not in a relationship with God, then you and I can't be in a relationship right. because that is my foundation. Yeah. 
And everything that I do and everything that happens from this point forward has to be built up on that and has to be built around that. And here's the sad reality, friends, is that some people, when they are considering someone to be uh, their companion, this is one of the last questions that they might ask or one of the last things they might consider. And that's the wrong order. You're, you're starting off wrong. Your relationship is doomed to fail if you don't have God in your relationship. And so if the person that you are even looking at, if the person that you are winking at, I don't care if anybody has no butterflies in your stomach. Because sometimes it's not butterflies in your stomach. It's really nausea. Uh, to, and, and you just can't tell the difference. Because later on in life you discover that maybe this wasn't the right person. I was attracted to all the wrong things. Huh. You see, because what we do is, y'all, and you know, a lot of us, many people, most people, is there's that physical attraction. I'm not, I'm not denouncing or belittling physical attraction because usually that's where it starts. There's something about this person that you are physically attracted to. Now that doesn't mean you have to be superficial. They got to be a model and drop dead gorgeous and all that. But there's something about them, whether it is their appearance, their looks, whether it's the way that they dress, whether it's the way that they carry themselves and conduct themselves, whether it's their, the way that they wear their hair, whether it's the fact that they got a gold tooth or not, something uh, caught your attention. <laughs> and when it caught your attention, you, you, you considered, uh, you know, entertaining the possibility. And so there's a physical attraction of some sort. Sometimes physical attraction can be conversation. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some, some people, you just have good conversation with them. And, you know, and, and that causes that. So it all begins with some form of attraction. But my brothers and my sisters, it's, 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 there's more to it than attraction. <laughs> the first of all, has to be God in their lives. The person has to be God-fearing. And so when we start going off of attraction, or we start going off of, watch this, perks, because some people look at other people, they look at the perks. Oh, that person has a nice car. That person has a nice house. That person has uh, makes pretty good money. That person has a pretty good job. That person is this. You start looking at all these things that the person has um, and or the person could potentially offer you or how you could potentially benefit from what this person has or who this person is. And so you start considering the perks. And now you've perked up. And so this now draws you in. So it's attraction, or it is it is the perks, um, you know, or, or what this person has to offer, or what they might be able to contribute to your life. And these things, my brothers and my sisters, some people they put in the the, the top seat. This these things takes precedence and or priority. Not God. These things. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm speaking to someone else. Speak with someone else, and it may not necessarily be the perks alone. It may not be the, the physical attraction alone. It could be the fact that you just don't want to be alone. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Come on. The fact is, I just don't want to be alone. I'm tired of being alone. I'm tired of going to restaurants and seeing everybody else booed up, and I'm in there boohooing, <laughs> sitting there by myself. I've got to take myself to the movies. I've got to take myself to, uh, to, 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 to dinner or to uh, what have you. I've got to call folk and, and see who wants to go just so I ain't got to go by myself. And so I'm just tired of being by myself. I'm tired of going home by myself. I'm tired of going to bed by myself. I'm tired of waking up by myself. I'm tired of celebrating my birthdays and special days by myself. And so your motivation, your interest is finding someone to be in your life just so you don't have to be by yourself. Huh. I've been having some conversation with some single folk and some of the single folk was telling me, you know, at this, and see, and, and this all changes, I need to throw this in there, this all changes at different stages and ages in your life. Right. Because at different ages and different stages, you may, you may decide uh, that certain things are okay at a certain stage that you didn't consider to be okay at a different stage. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Here it goes. I know some folk who are now a little bit more seasoned 
in their lives. They ain't spring chickens no more. So they're a little bit more seasoned. And so now, for them, what I hear them saying is, well, I would and I could consider marriage even if I'm not in love with the person. And I said, you got to help me with that. He said, well, it's about companionship. The fact that I don't have to be alone, the fact that I don't have to share these bills by myself, the fact that I don't have to do this and I don't have to do that by myself, uh, the person doesn't have to necessarily float my boat. The person doesn't necessarily have to give me butterflies. As long as I have someone to have some form of companionship with. So what we're doing is we're, 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 we're saying Com um, compatibility doesn't matter. Chemistry doesn't matter. None of those things matter because all I'm thinking about right now is companionship. And so there are some people that will settle. And there are some people that will compromise just to have a warm body next to them. And my brothers and my sisters, I'm, I, and, I'm, and, and I get criticized sometimes from some single folk saying, well, you can't really relate and identify to us because you ain't single and have not been for some nearly 30 years. And so you don't know what it's like. And I can't necessarily, I can't honestly say that I know what it's like to be in your position for those who might be single or what have you. But what I do know is that when you get to the point where you start compromising and settling just for companionship, you're going down the wrong direction. You're going down the wrong path. And some people, my brothers and my sisters, at a certain age, and a certain stage, they're giving in. They say, okay, love doesn't matter. Compatibility really doesn't matter. You know, chemistry really doesn't matter. This person really doesn't do it for me, but they're there. They're a warm body. And I can share some of the responsibility with. And so they get into relationships that they really don't want to be involved in. And I get in relationships for all the wrong reasons. So my friends, what I'm saying to you is that uh, God must be first. He must take precedence. He must be priority. He yes. must be looking at, are they first of all a God-fearing person? And then go down that list, uh, checking off this other stuff. But when you go in and you go off of physical attraction, you go off of loneliness, you go off of your needs and your wants and what have you, you put those in and, and, and God's spot, you put that and make that priority, what happens is you give in. Your, 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 you, 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 you find yourself... Um, having emotional ties huh. and or having mental ties, watch this, or having sexual ties. Hmm. And so it's those ties that end up connecting you to that person. And those ties, my brothers and my sisters, cannot sustain your relationship. That's really what I'm getting to. See, when you, say for example, someone who has become um, physically attracted to someone, and you become physically attracted to that person. And so now when it comes down to things that really ought to matter, like God, and spirituality, and faith, and religion, and those type of things, morals, and principles, and what have you, when it comes down to those things, you're willing to compromise, in many instances, compromise on those things. Why? Because your heart is in it. Mm -hmm. Because your feelings are caught up. I mean, you got feelings for him. You got feelings for her. And so it's hard to say bye or to say no or to let go because you're caught up. And so you're more willing or more apt to compromise when it comes to the God aspect because you got these other connections and these other ties. Am I making sense to you? Yeah. Yes. Physical, when it comes to sexual ties. When you become physically intimate with someone, physical intimacy is not just about uh, you having a good time. There's, there really is a connection. Biologically, there's a connection. Psychologically, there's a connection. Spiritually, there's a connection. And for some of you, you've been wondering, uh, you know, why you are the way that you are in some ways. Could it be because you have extended yourself? You have expanded yourself. You've made yourself available and accessible to so many people physically and or sexually mm -hmm. 
that now you got all these soul ties with all these different people. And they got real quiet in here. <laughs> it could explain a lot. Some folk, you see, we don't understand how powerful. Listen, intimacy is not just a sexual act. It's a spiritual act. And because it is a spiritual act, we make a connection with folk that is far deeper than just that physical connection. Right. And there's so many folk who are unfortunately um, so disheveled and so many other things because they got all these connections with all these people from their past. When it was supposed to be reserved for someone that you have made a commitment to and have established a covenant with because it's so deep. Because it's so deep and there's so much involved and so much is entangled and riding on that thing, it is supposed to be reserved for the one that you spend the rest of your life with. And so when we don't do that, we get all these connections and all these ties with all these people, and that's why we have all these wires crossed. Okay, y'all didn't come to hear that today. But it's the truth. And so, my brothers and my sisters, first of all, we must make certain that our connections with all these people uh, are not uh, superficial and topical. It's not based upon looks alone. It's not based upon um, attractions alone and, and sexual connections and all these other things. It must be based upon um, this person. Are they a God-fearing person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, y'all got similar interests. That's cute. But... Do they love God? <laughs> and I'm not talking about someone who just says, yes, I believe in God. Because remember, Satan believes in God. Right. The Bible says the devil believes in God and trembles at the sound of his voice and at the, at the, at the mere mentioning of his name. So it's more than just them believing in God because I've heard some folk that are telling me, you know, when they're t telling me about their new love interest, and I say, well, are they God-fearing? Oh, yeah, they, they, they said they, they, they love God. They said they, they know God. No, it's not just about them saying, it's not just about them um, acknowledging that there is a God, you know, that they believe in God, but are they God-fearing? Is God in the center of their life? Oh, when they go to church, it's, not more, it's more than just them going to church. Is God in the center of their lives? Because when God is in the center of your life, he influences your thoughts, you know, the way you think. He influences your behavior, the choices that you make. And if you're a God-fearing person, you hook up with someone who is not God-fearing, and God is not priority and take precedence, and he's not the foundation, when it comes time for you as a family unit to make decisions, their decision-making could be tainted because it is not a God-fearing individual. Are y'all hearing me on today? When this person decides to uh, make choices, listen, whether, so if it's the male, females, if it's the male, God has placed the male to be the head of the household. In other words, he's holding the man accountable for any and everything that happens in that household. He's not saying that the man is the head, meaning that he's better than you, or meaning that he um, is, you know, is, is, is more superior and all that. It's just, that's the order of God. He's made the man the one to whom he's holding accountable. So if the man, if the decision making ultimately falls upon the man, because that's who God is going to come looking for, then when the decisions are made, you want to make certain that the decisions that are being made are godly influence. Because if not, it can end up altering your entire family unit and the trajectory of your family. When, ate, when Eve ate of the fruit, who did God go looking for? He went looking for Adam. He says, Adam, where are you? He said, what have you done? It was not Adam that initiated this, it was Eve. So what I'm saying to you, friends, is that first of all, first and foremost, uh, before you say I do, as you're talking about family matters and so on and so forth, you better make certain if you're heading in the direction, desiring to be in a relationship with someone, first of all, you ought to be God-fearing. Second of all, they show sure enough definitely must be God-fearing or else you ought not even consider going forward. Conversation may be good, but we can't move no forward. May be somewhat compatible in some areas, may have some similarities and common interests and all that, but we can't move forward if God is not your priority, but not only God-fearing. Are they in a good space? See, you focused on you being in a good space, 
But why would you then hook up with someone who is not in a good space? See, that's why, friends, we ought to spend time uh, having some meaningful conversation with folk and spending time court and doing the courtship process. So one of the things that I, I teach, for example, in my uh, singles classes and or in before marriage classes and stuff like that is the importance of courtship. So what is courtship? Courtship, to be clear, is far different than dating. Now, for some of you, it's a matter of semantics. Dating and courtship is the same thing. I, I appeal to you that it is not. Dating, from this perspective, is merely just going out on a series of um, excursions with an individual. Uh, or individuals. You're going out, you're dating, and you're, um, you know, trying to find out, you know, which one um, you might want to be with, or whatever the case may be. And it's almost like you're gambling, and you're rolling dice, and you're you're taking risks, and and you're just going out, and you're spending and spending slash wasting time, and you are um, giving of yourself to someone who might not be a part of your life any longer than the date lasts. You know, so then what are you supposed to do, Pastor? If you ain't supposed to date, well, good question. I'm glad you asked. It is courtship. So courtship is, I decided, so based upon what it is that I'm looking for in an individual, first of all, are they God-fearing? And so during the God-fearing stage, watch this, it's very important. Doing the God, so when you found someone who is God-fearing, and there's some similar interest there, there's some form of chemistry, chemistry compatibility, you work on just establishing mere friendship. It's all we are, is we're just friends. And as friends, we just happen to spend time together. We're not putting a label on this. We're not putting any titles on this. You know, I'm not your boyfriend. You're not my girlfriend. You ain't my boo fame winner. No, ain't none of that. We have not defined this. So all we are is friends. And so it is as you are getting to know this person as an individual, and as you are building a friendship, if in building that friendship, you see that there really is some chemistry, some strong chemistry there. There really is a strong connection there. There really is some compatibility there. It is then that you uh, begin to perhaps have some conversation that this person might be worthy of engaging in an extended courtship. So now doing courtship, you're not, as in dating, going out with all these different people. Doing courtship, you and that person are now exclusively spending time together. You still ain't called this thing nothing. You ain't boyfriend, you ain't girlfriend, and uh, you ain't giving up the goodies and all that type of care and all the cookies, rather. You know, you, you are spending time building this relationship and going through the courtship process. So now during the courtship process, what you're doing is you're, you've, you've, you've already weeded others out. Now you're filling this one out. I sure hope somebody's hearing this. You're, you're filling them out. And so now as you're going out to eat as friends, but you're exclusively now going through the courtship process because you see something in this person. Mm -hmm. This person sees something in you that you feel as though this is somebody that I potentially could or wouldn't mind spending the rest of my life with. Now, we ain't at the point where we've gotten down on one knee, we've exchanged rings and all that. No, but there is something that I've seen in this person. There's something that this person is demonstrating to me during the friendship stage and us getting to know one another that makes me think that I could consider perhaps spending my life with this person. And so during the courtship, you turn it up a notch in terms of we're really being intentional in what we talk about. We're really being intentional in the questions that we ask of one another. We're really being intentional in where we're taking it. So you're built, so the time that you're spending is now an investment. Because what you're doing is you're trying to take this to the next level. You're trying to get this to a point where you and that person perhaps uh, make covenant uh, vows and um, exchange vows with one another and, 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 and you make that commitment one to another. But it is not clouded by all these other individuals. See, during dating, now you got to pick through all these individuals. 
Do I like this one? I like this about that one, but I don't like that. And I like this one about, you're going through all this, and you find yourself in a headspace that is just totally confusing. You find yourself totally, uh, uh, it, it complicates matters, and it's confusing to you. That's why my brothers and my sisters, uh, you know, when you get down to it, now you got to choose which one, like you're in a dating game of some sort, you know, a love connection. Uh, but when you're courting, you've already weeded out individuals that you're willing to give your time to. So let me say this. The reason, another reason why it's so important, because it's not only a matter of you giving your time to, it's a matter of who am I giving my heart to. Because whoever you give your heart to, you're really taking a chance and a gamble. Because if you don't, because if you have not exclusively zoned in on this person and you don't really, you know, have and, you're, and, 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 and not working through the courtship process with this person, my brothers and sisters, you can find yourself end up giving your heart to the wrong person and end up getting your heart returned to you shattered in pieces. Mm -hmm. Come on. I've seen it happen too many times. Mm -hmm. Where people see, because the truth of the matter is. You can't just give your heart to everyone. That's right. Because everybody can't handle your heart, and everybody won't, won't deal with your heart in a ginger matter, gingerly and in a sensitive matter. Everybody just ain't going to do it. That's right. So you got to be very careful who you give your heart to because when you give someone your heart, you're opening yourself up. You're sharing with them your most deep and darkest and most intimate secrets. You're sharing with them your past and your lifestyle and sharing with them things that you just don't randomly share or you shouldn't share with just any old body. And so when you allow them access, when you allow them entry, it's kind of like giving them a backstage pass to your life. Everyone, so when you have an access, all access pass, when you go to a concert or an event, you have an all-access pass, that means you can go anywhere and everywhere and just do what you want. The persons that's in the, blood, in the uh, nosebleed section, they can't do that. They're nowhere near uh, as close as you are. But you have an all-access. You can go back and interact and engage with the, 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 the stars and, and the celebrities and, and all that type of care and all. So when you give someone an all-access pass to your heart, you're saying, I'm giving you permission to have all access. I'm giving you entry into my life. And everybody can't handle that because I tell you something. When, when, when people who, uh, who are not really designed to be in your life for the rest of your life, when they decide they no longer want to be in your life, and they decide that, okay, you ain't who I thought you were, or this is not what I thought it was going to be, they decide to kick you to the curb, you'll find your life broken and shattered in, 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 in many pieces, and you'll have a difficult time trying to put it back together again. That's why you gotta be careful who you give your heart to. That's why I, I challenge you doing the courtship process, because if you make it through the courtship process to the covenant process, um, stage, where now you have made a covenant, this is who you're going to spend the rest of your life with, and there I have to admit you're still taking a gamble for the most part, but it is a more informed decision. You have been more intentional in making your decision. So with that person, I'm not saying they won't ever hurt you, I'm not saying they won't ever break your heart. But with this person, you both have made a covenant to one another and with one another to be with one another for the rest of your lives. So you're not easily giving up when things don't go right. You're not easily giving up when your feelings shift. Because in relationship, guess what? Your feelings shift. Sometimes you're more into that person at one stage than you are at another stage. So... How you handle when you're not into that person or when you're in the not so into that person stage? How do you handle it? Well, what sustains you in a relationship is the fact that you've made a covenant with that person. It helps you get through those times when you may not be feeling them or when they may not be feeling you. See, when you're not in the commitment part of that and you're just in dating and what have you, as soon as you fall out of feelings with that person, so now... We just break up. Dating sets you up for breakups, split ups, and, and so on and so forth. And so you break up, you split up, you go find somebody else. And then that goes south, and then you break up and split up and go find someone else. And you break up and split up. It sets you up for a lifestyle of breakups and split ups. 
as opposed to courtship, you're focusing on one person and hopefully it's moving toward covenant. And so it's not in and out, in and out, in and out. And so, my brothers and my sisters, when you have gotten to the point of covenant, you're not so quick to just walk away just because you ain't feeling them today. Because guess what? There will be seasons where the person is not as attractive to you as they once were. So how do you make it through those stages? Right, right. When you've made a covenant, it gets you through those stages. When, when, you have, when you have made a commitment to be with one another, it helps you get to those stages. Because guess what? I don't know if you know this or not, but there, there are point in times in our lives as we age that we get to a point where we put on a little more extra pounds. So that person may not be that slim and trim and, and, and that figure eight that you met and that you fell in love with. So what happens when figure eight turns into a zero? Uh -oh. You gotta still be willing and able to, to love that person. You can't just walk away because that person is no longer curvaceous or because that person has now aged or because that person doesn't look the way that they used to or doesn't make you feel the way they used to and so on and so forth. Are oh, y'all hearing this on today? If it's these things that help you sustain a relationship. So before you say I do, you better consider this because if you go in for the wrong reasons, you will be sadly disappointed and you will be greatly hurt or you will end up being miserable in a relationship with someone that you really ain't connected to. I'm doing it because I don't want to be alone. I don't want to spend the rest of my life alone. So I got, at least I've got someone to have companionship with. I got somebody to go out with, I got someone to eat with. You're going to be a miserable if, if, if that's all that you're looking for. That's the only reason why you're hooked up. We can't compromise based upon these. Uh, these superficial things, looks and all that other caring of. So they got to be in a good space. Are they mentally in a good space? You end up hooking up with someone who ain't mentally right, and you end up spending all these years with that person only to discover that they got some baggage that they have never unpacked. They got some issues that they've never dealt with. They've got some hurts that they've never been, that have never been healed. And now they're bleeding all over you. Are they in a good mental space? Are they in a good spiritual space? And health-wise and all that. All these things got to be considered, my brothers and my sisters. But just like you do it for yourself, you do it for them. Also, gainfully employed. Love don't pay the bills. Sorry to tell you. You can be in love all you want to. But that person, if they are physically able to be employed, gainfully employed, then they ought to be. There is no excuse. They ought to be carrying their weight. They ought to be bringing something to the table, not just a fork. <laughs> they ought to be bringing something to the equation. They ought to be, they ought to be um, able to help build the family unit. Again, shared with someone the other day, they're in, in a situation where they are handling everything and struggling while the other person is sitting back watching them take care of everything. And while the other person is, is benefiting from their hard work and their labor, they're just sitting back making excuses. And I try to tell that person and ask that person, does that sound like love to you? If someone loves you, are they just going to sit back and watch you struggle? Are they just going to sit back and watch you suffer? Someone who loves you, they're going to do whatever they can to help you and to meet you. God said, I'm giving you a help meet. Someone who can help you to meet and fulfill your God-given responsibility. I'm giving you someone who's compatible. I'm giving you a companion who is compatible to help you to become and do all that I've called you to be. Preachers of old also used to talk about how God uniquely took from man uh, to create woman, took from the rib. They said, notice he didn't take from the foot to suggest that man is to have his foot on top of and dominate the woman. He didn't take from the hand to suggest 
that the man uses his hand to dominate and to beat and to physically abuse the woman. He didn't even take from the mouth where physically, uh, um, um, uh, verbally um, and emotionally you uh, uh, abuse the woman. No, he took from the rib underneath the heart. Underneath where you can grab and hold and take care and nourish the woman. We have women uh, and women and men alike ought not be involved in relationships where persons are physically, verbally, mentally, or sexually abusive to them. He crap. He took this this person uh, from he created this person out of man, out of Adam. And he gave him someone to whom he would take care of and cherish, to hold near and to hold dear. And so I say this, if you're in a relationship with that person is not holding you near and holding you dear and, 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 and taking care of you, instead, of, uh, uh, and instead they are abusing you, my brothers and my sisters, you're in the wrong relationship. So before you say I do, these are things you ought to be considered because he's not going to guide you to someone who is going to abuse you. Now under this guy, let me say this and then I'm done. I am not one who believes or preaches and teaches that God is going to pick for you and point out who your mate is supposed to be. I don't, I don't believe that. Some people say, I'm praying to God that he shows me and, and picks my mate for me. I don't believe that God does that. Why don't I believe that God does that? Well, my brothers and my sisters, first of all, because God has given every last one of us the power of choice. And if he's given us the gift and the power and the ability to choose, that means we choose. That means he does not choose for us. Follow me. And so, if the most important decision that you'll ever make is a decision to follow God or to not follow God, is that not the most important decision? And if he doesn't choose that for you, then why is he going to choose what house you survive? Why is he going to choose what car you should buy? What school ought to, ought to go to? What city ought to move to? What job ought to choose? What person ought to marry? Why is he going to choose those things if he's not choosing salvation? And salvation is the most important decision that you'll ever make. I believe what God does is he guides us. I believe that God has created a type that we are attracted to. A type that will complement us, a type that we are compatible with, a type that we are drawn toward. So as we are drawn toward these particular types, there's nothing wrong with God guiding our paths. And we find ourselves in the same place or the same place as someone. But God ain't choosing, saying, you choose that person. Then God chooses you to certain ones that are compatible to you in, those, in these regards. And you have the power and the ability to choose who you decide to spend your life with. And so whoever you're with, for you married for, if you're with that person, don't blame God. <laughs> that was your choice. <laughs> Whether he guided you or not, that was your choice. You made that choice. You made that decision. And so what I'm saying to you, as we, before we say I do, there's some things we ought to consider. First of all, am I and are they God-fearing? Am I and are they in a good space? Am I and are they gainfully employed? And it is then that we allow God to guide us so that our paths cross. And during that courtship process, we've already weeded others out. We are now filling this person out as we make our decision and decide if we do or do not for the rest of our lives. If you receive that, give God some praise.